Welcome to the webinar on health insurance basics. Um, my name is Jesse Swisher and I am the Western Region Program Coordinator for PASA, which is the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, I'm joined here with Aaron Hart, who is the Director of Health Benefit Services with American Healthcare Group. She oversees their health and wellness programs for the firm. She also helped to create one of their key programs, Farm to Table Pittsburgh, in 2006. They're getting ready for their 10th annual conference coming up in March of 2016. They also do other programs such as Lunch and Learn series and ongoing educational programs to teach consumers how to eat healthy local real food. Erin is also a licensed insurance broker specializing in healthcare options for seniors and is a frequent speaker in the Pittsburgh healthcare arena, leading some seminars with healthcare options for seniors and other programs. So before I turn it over to Erin tonight, I'd like to start off with just a few housekeeping items. Um, the first one is that attendees will be able to view the PowerPoint slides. Everyone is on mute, um, so if you think of any questions as we go along, feel free to type some questions into the question area of the control panel on your right-hand side. At the end of the presentation, I will then go ahead and walk through the questions out loud Hello? for panelists to respond to. Looks like we have Erin just uh, joining in with us today. I was waiting for her to tune back in. We're just going through a few ho housekeeping matters. Um, so, as I was saying, go ahead and type your questions into the question panel. Um, if we don't have enough time in our hour today, we can also work to follow up with you by email as well. Also, we're going to be recording this webinar, so we'll be able to share a, a link with you to the recording following the webinar. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Erin Hartz. Hi, everyone. I'm going to go through the healthcare update, um, mostly as it relates to Pennsylvania. So probably most of you are from Pennsylvania. Um, the Basically, what we're going to be going over is healthcare versus health insurance and also a little bit of wellness, um, especially in the extremely competitive healthcare market that we've experienced throughout Pennsylvania, um, what we've found is that a lot of healthcare companies, um, or health insurance companies rather, are talking about themselves as if they're healthcare. And I think it's important to point out, and we usually start with the slide, that health insurance is purely a, an insurance product. Um, healthcare is what you get when you go to the doctor or the hospital or what have you, and then wellness is what you sort of can do for yourself to take care of yourself and to be healthy. Um, so when we're looking at the various health insurance products, it's important to realize that um, while, you know, they try to appeal to us and pull on our heartstrings, um, you know, really it's a financial decision so that when you're making it, you want to make sure you're buying the right product at the right monthly price and then as you encounter doctors and hospitals and so forth, you're going to know what you're going to be paying in co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance. And we're going to go all over what all of those terms mean. Um, this slide is just sort of like a comment on health and wellness. And these statistics are for all of America. Um, and they pretty much translate to Pennsylvania as well. Um, there's a lot that we can do culturally to fix um, you know, these various categories, and it's basically food, exercise, and stress management are the three big pieces of a wellness program. So we do a lot of work with school districts and companies to make sure that they can help their um, employees or students try to really have access to these sorts of things on a daily basis. So the health insurance market, and what we mean by this is this is who pays health claims. Um, when you are hurt or you're sick, there's, you know, one of these individuals, um, one of these types of organizations will be paying your claim. So if it's 
a you know if you have an individual product or versus a group product, that means that you went out and bought your own insurance or you're covered through an employer group. There's Medicare, which is mostly for people over 65. There's Medicaid, which is for people who have low income. There's workers' comp for people who are injured through their work. And if you're an employer, you have to have workers' comp coverage on your employees. Um, auto policies also contain a medical clause so that if you're injured in a car or motorcycle accident, the um, your car insurance policy would cover you. And then there's also personal liability, which means if you're, um, like the classic example is someone trips and falls on your sidewalk in front of your house and you're liable to them. So, and then I guess the, the eighth category that I should add to this is self-funding. And that's what a lot of people do who don't have health insurance coverage is they pay as they go. And um, which is fine in, until you hit something where, you know, the claim is going to be more than you can afford or um, more than you can pay. So there's a lot of people um, going back to before the Affordable Care Act was passed where people, a lot less people had insurance then. And um, basically what they were doing was that they wouldn't go to the doctor or they would just pay as they went. So the health insurance terms, I've already probably used most of these. Um, the premium is what the monthly cost of the policy is. And um, the co-pays are what you pay, it's a flat amount. So a co-pay to go to the doctor might be $20. Co-insurance is when you pay a percentage for the healthcare service. So an example of co-insurance is usually about 10% or 20%. You, you know, you go to the doctor and the insurance company pays 90% of the claim and you are left with 10%. Deductibles are what you pay first before the health insurance kicks in. Um, it's typically only for certain line items on the schedule of benefits which means, you know, a lot of plans, doctor's office visits aren't subject to the deductible. Or, and certainly well visits aren't, aren't subject to the deductible. So that if you go to the doctor just for your annual exam, then you wouldn't have to pay a deductible. You would just go and then the insurance company would pay the whole thing. Um, all of these items are what make up the annual costs. So when you're looking to see how to judge a policy, these are the things that you need to know, um, exactly what they are and what you would be paying in a worst case scenario, which is when you get into the out-of-pocket max. So if you have, if you find out that you need to have um, knee surgery and you need to go to physical therapy and there's a bunch of tests leading up to it, like MRIs, then you would possibly hit your out-of-pocket max which means all of the co-pays, co-insurance, and deductibles added together that you pay throughout the year, you're only going to pay a certain amount out of your own pocket. And that's on top of the premium. So the premium might be $500 a month, and the out-of-pocket max might be 10000 So you're going to pay the 500 a month whether or not you go to the doctor, and then the 10000 would be if you start using services and you start paying co-pays and deductibles and co-insurance, it, it would never exceed what that out-of-pocket max would be for that particular plan. And so these are really the five pieces of the puzzle that you need to look at to determine how much is this plan going to cost. And of course, I always say nobody has a crystal ball. So you have no idea if, you know, what's going to happen to you. Um, sometimes people do have, you know, something planned like cataract surgery or you know, you know that you have diabetes, so you have certain needs that you need to have, like certain physicians you go to on a regular basis, certain specialists that you see. So you want to make sure that the things that you know, you can make a grid, you know, annualize the premium, so multiply what the premium is by 12, and then write down what you know you're going to use throughout the year. And then, you know, depending on your health, if you're, and depending on your age and, um, what types of services you may, you know, not even know that you're going to need in the following year in emergency situations. 
um, you can kind of just plot that out across all plans. Um, so for example, when I'm working with someone who's on Medicare, they might say, well, you know, I've been in the hospital twice over the past five years, so we might put in a three-day hospital visit across, you know, when we're comparing three plans so that you can see, well, this hospital visit would cost this on this plan and it would cost this on that plan. And that way you can truly get like an apples to apples kind of a comparison. Um, you have to personalize every single healthcare purchase because everyone has such different needs. Um, so other terms that you'll see in the health insurance world are networks. Um, a network is the group of providers who have contracted with the insurance company and basically they're giving the insurance company discounts on services. And the providers range everything from primary care doctors, specialists, pharmacies, um, durable medical equipment companies, podiatrists, physical therapists, chiropractors. All of the various providers have agreed to a certain fee schedule with the insurance company. So back up on this slide, when you're paying a copay, you're going to pay a copay whether or not you know, if it's a $20 copay, if the doctor's fee is $100 or $120, you're going to pay the flat $20 copay. But in coinsurance, if you go to an in-network provider the in, and the contract is for $120 and you have a 10% coinsurance, you'd pay $12. If it's a $500 service and you're paying 10%, you'd pay $50. So coinsurance, a lot of people are afraid of it, but when you look at what the fees that the physicians and various providers are charging, um, you know, a $10,000 hospital stay would have a $1,000 coinsurance. And sometimes the copays could be, you know, even more than that. So it's important to know um, and, you know, to be able to ballpark what these things cost. There's more and more access to, to that data. Um, there's indices where you can look up, you know, what should an MRI cost or what should a um, CT scan or physical therapy, all these different services that we're using. There are things that are out, services and websites and calculators that are out there to help you determine how much your services are going to cost. And especially when you're paying the deductible, when you're paying 100% of a, of, of a office visit or a procedure, you want to make sure you know, you know, would it be better for me to go to an independent, standalone surgical center versus a hospital? You know, all of that kind of data is out there. And certainly, if you're in the position where you're choosing, you can um, ask the providers to, to give you that information. Um, different types of networks include PPOs and HMOs. Um, the acronyms are there, Preferred Provider Organization and Health Maintenance Organization. Basically, the difference between these two pretty much boils down to the HMOs don't have an out-of-network benefit and the PPOs do. Um, I run across this a lot because um, I'm out meeting with people all the time, and people think that HMOs mean you need to have referrals to see specialists. And it really doesn't mean that anymore, um, not in the Pennsylvania market at least. There are um, really no plans where the referrals are still required that you run across. Um, it's certainly something that you can ask, but it's typically there's open access to specialists. You might need the pre-authorization for procedures, but that would be true of both PPOs and HMOs. So that's an insurance company thing, not an HMO versus PPO. Um, and then something to, to keep in mind, you know, when you're looking at the network, um, I see people going with PPOs because they you know, go to another part of the country for part of the year, or, you know, they just have this feeling like if I'm in an emergency situation and we like to travel, um, you know, plans have to pay for emergencies. So whether you're in Philadelphia or Arizona, if you have an emergency situation, go to the emergency room and your plan will cover it. You should contact them and let them know because they might have to do some like a retrospective um, pre-authorization, but there's, there's pr patient protection rules built around all health plans um, that 
allow you to use that for emergency coverage. Now, you might have a copay, so you might have, I've seen some plans on the marketplace with a $500 emergency room copay. Um, the Medicare plans have a $75 emergency room copay. So it just depends on um, what the situation is. And typically, if you do go to the emergency room, if you're admitted to the hospital within a certain amount of time, then that copay is waived, and then you get into what the inpatient hospital copay would be, or deductible or co-insurance, whatever the case may be. So individual coverage. Um, basically, this entire market changed when the Affordable Care Act was passed, and it was um, passed in March of 2000. Um, before then, when you tried to get health insurance, you would have to go through medical underwriting, and the companies could rate you up or deny coverage. And what basically happened with the passage of that act was that when you apply for health insurance now, you're rated based on your zip code, your age, and whether or not you use tobacco. And um, that's pretty much it. So that if you are super healthy and you're 25, then you're going to pay the same amount as if you were extremely sick and you're 25, um, if you lived in the same zip code and neither one of you smoked. Um, so, and I have on one of the um, later slides some rates, some sample rates, so I can give you an idea of, you know, some of the rates that are out there. But the individual coverage that you're getting, whether you go through directly to an insurance company to buy coverage or through healthcare.gov will always be through an insurance company. So I talk to people all the time who say, oh, I'm on Obamacare, or oh, my daughter's on, um, my daughter got Obamacare. Well, basically what that means is they went through healthcare.gov, which is the federal marketplace, to buy an insurance plan. And it would be the same exact plan that they would get directly from the insurance company. So the companies publish their plans, and they offer some through this marketplace. And what basically the marketplace does is you type in your um, income that is projected for the year, and that will tell you whether or not you're going to get a premium subsidy, which is the tax credit. And um, if your income, and I, there's a slide for this too, so I won't get that deep into it, but it's based on the federal poverty level. So um, the point to this is, is that the, the plans are always from an insurance company. Um, the, if you go direct to the insurance company, you won't get the premium subsidy. So if you, if you're, if you know you're eligible for it, go through healthcare.gov in order to get that premium subsidy. Um, it's basically like going on to Travelocity and, um, you know, you put in your information and then it kicks out, you know, these are all the flights that are available. So as soon as you put in your information, it'll come up with all the plans that are out there. And you don't have to type in your personal information or your email address to get rates for your area. Um, I tested it on um, yesterday morning and I was able to go on to healthcare.gov and put in some, you know, fake information about me and my family, and I was able to pull up some rates just because I wanted to make sure it worked, and I could, I'll show you what came up with the rates. But, um, so, you know, that's pretty much what this slide is all about. Um, in Pennsylvania, we do use the Federal Marketplace website. When Tom Wolf became governor, he considered using a, developing a separate website, but then decided not to. So um, this is what we're using. And I think there are 17 states or so who are using healthcare.gov in lieu of developing their own state-run website. The deadline for applying for coverage for the, on healthcare.gov um, it's February 15th. It's very confusing because I'm getting emails saying that the deadline is December 15th. And that's if you want a January 1st effective date. 
if you want a February 1st effective date, you still have time to apply until January 15th. So you have to apply by the 15th in order to have the coverage start on the first day of the following month. However, if you don't apply by February 15th for a March 1st effective date, you will lose the ability to enroll through an individual plan until the following open enrollment period. So open enrollment started November 1st. And on um, November 1st, you were able to go on to healthcare.gov, type in your information, and then pull up the rates for your area. And you can sign up for a plan, and it'll start January 1st. So January is the soonest you can get a plan um, being in open enrollment right now. Um, but however, if you have a special enrollment period, like you have a new baby, or you move, or you lose employer coverage, then uh, you get divorced, get married, then those are all special enrollment periods, and you're able to enroll if there's an exception. Last year during um, tax season, it was found that a lot of people were paying the penalty. The penalty was lower for 2014. So people that were paying the 2014 penalty on their tax return had a special enrollment period to buy coverage. I think they had until May 15th or maybe it was April 15th to get coverage for the following month. Uh, I don't, and that was made, like that was like a game time decision, so I don't know if they're going to do that again this year. But these are the penalties. Um, the main part of the slide is 2015. And then in parentheses are the 2016 penalties. So basically, um, if you don't have coverage, the family max and penalty that you'll pay for 2015 is $975. And it's based on those calculations, 325 per adult, 162.50 per child. Or if 2% of your income is higher than that, then you would pay the higher of the amount, up to $975. As you can see, in 2016, the family max is more than doubling to 2085. So that's if, starting January 1st, um, you didn't sign up for coverage and you go for more than 60 days um, without coverage. There are exemptions to this penalty, and I put that that um, slide there, uh, I'm sorry, the link for where you can find if there are, um, if you're in an exempted status and it's based on income and also whether or not the coverage that's available to you is unaffordable. So if after you apply for coverage and you see the rates and it's just too much you can't afford it, there are certain guidelines that you may fall into that would give you an exemption to this penalty. But it's basically recorded on your tax return. So um, that was one of the Supreme Court cases where this was being battled out, was whether or not the federal government could tax um, individuals or families based on health insurance coverage. And it was found that it wasn't a penalty. It was actually called a tax. So it was legal. These are the federal poverty guidelines for 2015. Um, you can get a premium subsidy if your income is below these amounts. So, and it's the 400%. That's the cutoff. Um, so, if you're a family of four and your income is 97,000 less than $97,000, then you're eligible for premium subsidies. Um, the um, the up to um, up until I'm sorry I'm reading uh, just a piece of information up until this year the medical assistance was not expanded in Pennsylvania until I believe it was December 15th of 2014 um, Pennsylvania enacted a an expanded medical assistance plan, which I'll get to in a slide, and I actually have some data. So if you do fall into the first column category, or between the first and second, between 100% and 133%, you're, 
you are probably eligible for medical assistance, but I'll give you the limits um, on, on I think the next slide. Um, no, this is so. This is an example of what these plans cost. Um, as you can, so this is me and my husband, and uh, the three kids were different ages than my actual kids. Um, and both of us, I put down as non-smokers. These would be your monthly premiums and what the deductibles are. So if a bron if you had a bronze plan, you'd pay six hundred and forty dollars a month with a twelve thousand dollar family deductible. Now, again, wellness programs are, or wellness visits, like the annual exam, well child visits, mammograms, um, those would not be subject to the deductible. But as you can see on these slides, it's extremely expensive to cover a family of five. Um, the, and, but there's, there's so many different plans. I, I put these up there just so that you had an idea of these metal levels as well. So the bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, basically what the federal government did through the Affordable Care Act was they defined these levels, and it's based on how much you pay out of pocket um, for both premium and co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance. If you do get a premium subsidy, you will also get help paying for co-pays, co-insurance, and deductibles. So I've worked with people who are single, who were making um, maybe in like the you know thirty thousand dollar a year range, or twenty four thousand dollar a year range between that two hundred percent and the two hundred and fifty percent, and the deductible that they had, you know, was lowered because they were getting assistance with cost sharing as well. Um, I typed in this little grid. Um, these are community blue rates um, that I picked up. I was at the Highmark store, and so I picked these these plans up. The first column is the age, so you can see, you know, if you're 18 and you have a $4,500 deductible on this one particular plan, you would pay $130.88. The same exact plan when you're 64 is going to cost you $618.33. Um, so the deductible, you know, changes what your monthly premium is as well as your age. The um, income limits, I'm going to switch over to another, I'll, I'll go over this real quick. This is for medical assistance. Um, here we go. So starting in January of this year, um, this, and this was this is this information is from the Pennsylvania Health Law Project. They're a great source of information. Um, you can go onto their website and subscribe to their um, to their newsletter, and they send out a monthly newsletter. And I get a lot of great information from it. But this was one of the the slides that they had sent out. Um, so the income limit has dropped significantly. Um, it's actually increased significantly from um, the prior years. And so if your income is, as a single person is less than $1,354 and resources do not count, then you're eligible for medical assistance. Um, there are many different programs through medical assistance. Um, the first line is basically for, you know, adults. The second one is for people over 65 who have um, are low income. Their income as a single person would have to be less than $981 and less than $2,000 in resources. And this is because Medicare would be primary and then Medicaid would be secondary. So Medicare would pay for what Medicare pays for and then Medicaid would pick up their cost sharing. And I have some Medicare slides that I'm going to go over as well. Um, so these various levels, if anybody's interested, um, you can, I can send this over to you. But this is really the part here that I wanted to show, um, the medical assistance limits. Um, if, and further down, there was information about pregnant women. Let me flip back to that because um, this is significant because if you're pregnant, you should have insurance. And this gives you 
you can apply for medical assistance at any time. So if I, I get calls from people who are pregnant who don't have insurance and then they think that they have to wait until open enrollment, but when in fact they can apply for medical assistance if their income limit, if their income level is less than, if they're single and they're pregnant, 29, 22, because the household size counts as two, because it's you and the baby that you're pregnant with. Um, and then if you have kids, um, the, you know, the limits are, are below. Um, okay. Okay, the, the um, link that's listed here is a questionnaire that you can go on um, through the Pennsylvania Health Law Project to see if you're eligible. Otherwise, there's an application on, it used to be called the Depart Department of Public Welfare, and now it's called the Department of Human Services. Um, you can go on that and apply, which is the Compass application, but if, you're, if you just want to see if you're eligible, you can quickly go through the, that um, little questionnaire. So how do you choose? You make sure your providers are in network. So you want to make sure that if you want to go to um, Hammett, that Hammett's in the network, um, or whoever your physical therapist is, or you know, chiropractor, primary care doctor, annualize the monthly premium. Um, I sort of went over this, you know, you project what you need, and you calculate the the cost sharing for all of those, and choose the most affordable plan. Um, you know, the, the insurance companies do have reputations, you know, one way or the other, and I meet people who hate one company, and I'll walk into the next meeting, and they love that company. So, um, and I know people say, well, I would never buy from them because, you know, I don't like them. But, you know, when it comes down to it, if it's, the, if it's really affordable for you, that's why you're buying insurance. So insurance is a risk management tool that you use to save money, not so that you can, um, you know, pay more so that the, you know, because the ads worked that the insurance company has been buying over the last 10 years or 15 years or whatever. Um, I left these, these slides in there. If anybody has a group plan that they're managing, um, we typically, you know, have these guidelines um, for analyzing group plans. Um, basically, make sure that the plan is meeting your needs and compare brokers as well as um, health insurance options. So you want to make sure that you, people are really um, digging into the plan because, as you know, the costs can get enormous when you start multiplying, you know, a family coverage is $1,500 a month or $1,900 a month, and you have... Um, 10 employees, then, you know, you're spending um, almost $20,000 a month, you want to make sure that it, the costs are being managed, um, as well as structuring the benefits so that it, you know, matches up with what you want to accomplish. We, we have, it's, it's less so now that the Affordable Care Act is here and so it sort of produced these guidelines for covering wellness, but there were some people that wouldn't cover prenatal visits for pregnant employees, and then they found that their neonatal costs were getting out of control. Once they implemented no copays for prenatal visits, their costs dropped significantly. So it's very important to help the employees, you know, possibly manage their health by just giving them tools so, so that they can do it for themselves. You don't need to do it for them. Um, I'll skip through this and get to Medicare, um, because I want to leave time for questions. The Medicare options for, um, basically, you can buy Medicare, you know, Part A is generally free, and Part B is one hundred four ninety a month. Um, if you just have, basically, for people over 65, or if you have end-stage renal disease or Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, if, you have, if you're on Medicare, you can be under 65 because you're on Social Security disability. After 24 months, you're eligible for Medicare. So this is, if you just had your red, white, and blue card, you would pay this cost sharing um, when you went to the doctors or the hospitals. Um, the Part B, which is the doctor's piece, you has $147 deductible, and then you pay 20%. Um, 
the Part B premium, which is 104.90 a month, is probably not going up next year because they announced that there's no cost of living increase under Social Security. Um, there's a hold harmless clause, which means that if you're on, if you're collecting Social Security and it doesn't go up, then they can't increase your Part B premium. But the costs have gone up, so they have to spread out the higher costs over a smaller group of people. And those people are people who are um, getting on Medicare in 2016, um, people who aren't collecting Social Security yet, so they're, um, you know, maybe they're still working or they just decided to, you know, wait to collect Social Security until they're 67. Um, if those people will pay also the higher amount in 2016. It was in the news about three weeks ago. All the papers around the state covered it. No one knows exactly what the rate was going to be, but it was quoted around $156 a month for Part B. Medicare Advantage are plans that, that become your Medicare coverage. So you're getting your Medicare benefits through an insurance company. Um, you know, plans like Geisinger and, you know, Security Blue, Advantra, those are all Medicare Advantage plans. Most of them also cover Part D, which is the prescription drug piece of Medicare. It becomes your only insurance. And typically, you pay co-pays for services as opposed to um, the Medicare cost-sharing rates that were on the last slide. Um, the Medicare Advantage plans also cover other things like um, vision, dental, hearing. They usually have a gym network with some silver and fit or silver sneakers plans. Um, it combines the coverage for hospitals and doctors. And again, there are HMOs and PPOs. So HMOs, there's no out-of-network benefit. A PPO, there is an out-of-network net benefit. And then there's SNP plans, which are special needs plans. Um, they might have a plan for people who have diabetes. There are plans for people who have cardiovascular disease or have severe mental illness or who are institutionalized. And those plans are specifically um, designed to take care of people who have those different health conditions. Um, and again, just like the um, individual plans, you want to make sure that the providers that you want to use are in network. Here. I take a look at when we're looking at people who are on Medicare. There's a program in the state called PACE. This is for people over 65, uh, 65 and over, I should say. If you're an individual and your income's less than $1,958, or you're married and your income's less than $2,625, you're eligible for PACE, PACE Net, actually. Um, and they do not look at resources. So this is, that's your monthly income. Um, so if you have resources means savings, basically. So if you have you know, $50,000 in savings and you're married and your income's $2,500 a month, then you're eligible for PaceNet. You both are. And even if you're not taking prescriptions, I usually encourage people to sign up for Pace because if you're a Pace member, it lets you change plans during the year. Um, you don't have to have, you don't have to be in the annual enrollment period. Um, these are Medicare, this is the Medicare information now. Um, typically you, you enroll when you are 65, so it would be the three months before, the month of, and three months after, or when you lose employer coverage. Um, that's, that's when you would enroll in Medicare. Um, the Annual enrollment period is October 15th through December 7th, and that's why you're seeing every other commercial um, is, you know, based on Medicare plans on TV, radio, print, everything. Um, that's all happening right now. Um, if you, if people are dual eligible or they move outside of the service area of the plan, if they're institutionalized, which means they go into a nursing home. They lose employer coverage if they have the low income subsidy under Part D, or they have PACE, should also be on there. Those are all special enrollment periods. So um, 
oftentimes I'll meet someone in June, for example, and they, you know, want to change plans, but they, you know, can't. But then I, after talking to them, realize that they have eligibility for PACE, so they'll sign up for PACE and um, then have a special enrollment period. Um, I use PACE a lot as an example because it's it's one of the programs that people are eligible for with the highest income limits. And they actually expanded it um, about a year and a half ago. Um, they expanded it because they had m more money in the program than they were spending. It's the money that comes from the lottery. Um, so that's the end of my slides. Um, that's my contact information there. Jesse, are you there? Yes, thanks, Erin. Um, sure. So now, if you'd like, we can go ahead and turn it over to some questions from folks sure. tuning in. And I did have a question from Laura Hewitt. She asks, if I live with someone unmarried, keep separate checking accounts and a shared checking account, chipping in household expenses, are we a household of two or are we both single? Um, no dependents, uh, no kids, I'm assuming. Um, for um, the tax purposes, so for the penalty purposes, you would be single, so your income would be, um, you know, based on whether or not you'd pay a penalty. If you're, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. I can find out. Okay, and she further says she has no kids. Um, so yeah, we okay. can look into following up with her about that afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Neil Palmer. And it says, I have a plan with an HSA, but I'm considering terminating the plan. Are HSA plans still available and are they sensible? Yes, I love HSA plans. So what HSA plans are, are plans that have a high deductible. Um, well, they used to be considered high deductible. Now they're kind of fairly normal deductibles, like 1,200 for an individual and 2,400 for a family coverage. Um, so you have to have one of those types of plans in order to get, in order to fund a health savings account every year. Um, the and there's a limit to how much you can put in, but it it basically works like an IRA. So you put the money in tax-free, and as long as you use it for qualified medical expenses, it comes out tax-free. And if you're over 55, there are catch-up contributions, so you can actually um, put more money into the plan so that you can, you know, build up an account. So it's it's really um, if you have if you have money and you know you're going to be spending it. On healthcare costs, why not use pre-tax dollars to, to 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 finance those things? And what I've found is that um, you know you don't even need to fund the health savings account until you know you have a claim. So if it's you know if you don't have you know an extra thousand dollars to put in your health savings account during the year, then but you get a bill for a thousand dollars, just wait until you need to pay the bill, open up the account, and you know you can use it. Um, so it's a way to save money if um, you're saving for long-term care or if you're interested in long-term care. Um, some people use it as a sort of like a long-term care self-funding. Um, and as, when you're over 65, you can actually take it out. You would pay taxes on it, but if you wanted to use it for something else, you could pay the tax on it, just like an IRA. Or if you keep using it, for qualified medical expenses after you're 65, then you never pay taxes on it. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the lines are open if anyone else has any other questions. I don't have any in the queue at the moment.
Okay, and if anyone has any further questions, they can also follow up directly with Erin. Um, they have her email address and phone number available on the screen. Since uh, there are no other questions coming through, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. And thank you so much, Erin. Do you have any final closing um, comments? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much, and everybody have a good night. Thanks, Jesse. Mm -hmm.